Hi, Tish. Hi, Nick. So glad to have you here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to start off with very difficult questions in, in the beginning because our mind is like super warm and fuzzy after lunch. Sure. So let me go ahead. Okay. Um. Pose away the hard questions. <laughs> What is your favorite children's story? Ooh. Growing up, I loved Roald Dahl. Roald Dahl. Anything Roald Dahl. Anything uh, Roald Dahl. Probably my favorite, though, of all of them was Matilda. Matilda, do you remember the story? Is about a young girl who is pretty much neglected by her parents and is hyper-intelligent and teaches herself to read and through the devotion of one teacher is able to open up her thinking, her life experiences, is able to dive into incredible literature that's well beyond her years and uh, is just able to access a world beyond her tiny little bubble of abuse and neglect from her parents and it was just for me an inspiring book i remember i read it when i was about nine or ten years old and it just opened up a, a, a different way of thinking about education and about childhood stories and um to this day it remains one of my favorites until the viral doll yes so good all right awesome mm. if you have one extra hour in a day oh yeah. what would you devote it to being quiet quiet quite simply um like meditation you mean or yeah you know i just feel that I try to accomplish too much every day and I'm not as good about giving myself the time to just sit and do nothing because um, I work full time. Mm. I'm also a doctoral student. I try to help my friends and my mother and my family members if things come up. So mm. I try to really be present in people's lives. I try to be present in my partner's life hmm. and sometimes I don't give myself the time to sit quietly hmm. um, maybe it's meditation maybe it's reading maybe it's doing a little bit more exercise like yoga or just going for a walk and hmm. not listening to anything not doing anything I also fill up my hours with podcasts and with audiobooks and hmm. sometimes it's important just to be still Yeah. And quiet. So if I had an extra hour, I would prioritize doing nothing. Absolutely nothing. Wow. I'm calm listening to that. <laughs> I, I tend to be really scattered and really, I just fill up every hour. And that's actually quite sort of detrimental in terms of the full yeah, cause spectrum, right? You want to be able... Things are so fast. Exactly. And you want to give yourself some time just to actually rest. And I don't... Sure. I don't allow myself that, which is, um, it, which is something I recognize and something I'm working on. Right. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I need to uh, spin my microphone on your side because I realize that it's um, uh, pointing the opposite way. Okay. <laughs> this way? Uh, I'm gonna, so the, the sign has to be facing the speaker. Okay, it's perfect. Recording, but it's, just, I just, but it's the yeah. sound is better now. Hello. Test, test. Yeah, but it, it should still be in, but I just okay. forget a small detail. There's editing. Oh, no, I'm not going to edit it. It's, I'm not going to edit it. It's just raw, authentic. Amazing. But I love your answer, so I want to continue. Great. Matilda and, and quietness. Sitting <laughs> still. Yeah. All right, can we continue? Yes. <laughs> um, if you can be in any sitcom, TV series that you can be involved in, can play a part in we can live you can experience what would that be oh great question i grew up in the 90s so you know i was a high school kid in the 90s and um i watched friends religiously since like 1994 basically so if you'd asked me that question 10 years ago i would have lived in monica and rachel's apartment and hung out in greenwich village in the 90s and <laughs> been in a in the coffee shop with them but now 
what am I watching these days that I like? I'm watching something on Netflix at the moment called The Sars about the fall of the Romanov dynasty in Imperial Russia. And that's kind of fascinating. I, the Sars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, The Sars, basically. So it's the fall of um, Nicholas, Tsar Nicholas. The Emperor. The Emperor. Mm-hmm. And um, I've always been fascinated with Russian history, the Russian Empire, how expansive it was. Um, how unequal it was. Yeah. Um, so actually, I would probably be living in Russia at the turn of the 20th century yeah. and be witness to the Bolshevik Revolution and this this turn, you know, from Imperial Russia to what they were trying to rebuild as the as their sort of year zero, right, as the beginning of an egalitarian equal society. Mm. Wow. That reminds me also about the French Revolution when they tried to, they did overthrow the, the king. Yes. Right? Yeah. And absolutely. The, the change would have been awesome to experience. Oh, right? incredible! Yeah. I mean, you know, it's something that we just study for years and years and years in different history classes, and how pivotal these years of social change were and social turmoil, um, and the dynamics that created for the rest of Europe and the ripple effects that communism had in China and in Cambodia and Vietnam and Laos and the fear that it created in the rest of the world, the real fear that it held um, within American foreign policy as well. So, mm. yeah, just such a such a pivotal moment in in social and world history. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know you studied uh, history for undergrad and I, I would love to go into more details about your views and your experience on that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Mm. What was in your high school locker? Probably illegal substances. No, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, I, I was a fairly well-behaved high school student. Um, I, I, at the very beginning of high school, lots of sports stuff. I oh, did? Like, I was, a, I was a little bit of a jock, so I was doing lots of different types of sports, which I loved in terms of uh, interacting with my teammates. Um, and I, you know, was doing soccer and basketball and track and field and then the second half of high school I was doing a lot of theater so it was probably Mm -hmm. my scripts right I would be in different plays in a couple of different plays every year and I don't know what people are using now but at the time we would just carry our scripts around with us so I was always sort of taking notes on my scripts and if I sort of had a little bit of time during the day, I would just be memorizing lines, and that was my favorite extracurricular activity. You know, I, my closest friends were my friends that I was that I was hanging out with after class in the drama studio. You know, in the in the in, on stage, basically. And where was this high school? In Jakarta. In Jakarta International. Yes, exactly. School. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Wow. Well, you had a very eclectic uh, senior year it seems <laughs> um i did i did well it was over the four years of high school oh, um and being it just was uh, such a special experience because the school was it had so no, no. It had, yeah it had students from all over the world so i was you know interacting with students from different countries in europe and australia and south america and north america and um Fewer students actually from Africa and Asia. I mean, there were a lot of Korean students, but uh, not other nationalities. And um, we almost took that for granted, actually. But, you know, that doesn't happen in other times of our lives. We don't have the chance to be interacting with people from so many different backgrounds and so many different cultures who speak this very diverse array of languages Mm -hmm. and have different family backgrounds and bring different ways of thinking, you know, and and their parents were such a mix of diplomats and people who were working in NGOs or UN agencies or a lot of oil families, for example. So we had a lot of students who were coming from Alberta and Canada or Texas and the U.S. And that's just a a really good experience in in preparing you for life is how you interact and how you manage your relationships with different people. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk about your college. Um, I know you, you studied history first. Yeah. And and then for your first master's, you took international development. Uh, yeah. Is that, 
Is that right? Yeah. So I was. Um, so I, I studied history as an undergrad at um, at, a, at Barnard College, which is one of the undergraduate colleges linked to Columbia University. It's a women's college, not a very marketable degree. And um, at the time, I decided, um, based on a study abroad experience in India, where I became uh, very involved in an educational NGO, that I I wanted to study education policy and planning, and I became a, a very strong believer in the right to education, that it is a fundamental human right to provide basic education to all people and that mm. all children, all people have the right to achieve their potential through mm. education. And um, it's really been my thinking and my foundation for everything that I've done in my career since uh, my time in India. So that's mm. been pretty much 18 years. Um, and when I was doing my master's, I was looking at international education and development. So mm. uh, how we work within national education systems, how we um, advocate for education policies that are inclusive, that promote equality, that promote access, um, how we plan, so very pragmatically and operationally, how we plan and budget within education systems. Mm. And early on, I knew I wanted to work in the hardest locations. For some reason, I was convinced that I wanted to work in post-conflict countries. Yeah. And, um, you know, at the age of 24 or 25, I already knew that I, I wanted to experience um, a humanitarian lifestyle, basically. You know, and, and it, my dream job when I was 24 was to work with the UN and, and work in these, in these societies, in these post-conflict contexts. I didn't know what that meant at the time. Mm. And I was really lucky to be able to achieve that. Uh, I sort of fell into that, into that career. Um, but it was really from the, the thinking that I wanted to work in education and, and building education systems and, and ensuring educational quality and equity. Mm. But why education, Letitia? As in, do you like to teach, or was it bring me back to the like the experience of education itself? What, what attracted to? Yeah. For what attracted you to it? I love interacting with young people. I love interacting with kids. Um, but for me, it comes from a social justice perspective, right? Education in society is the equalizer. Um, I loved school as a kid, and I was given this wonderful education, right? I, I got to study at a school like JIS. I got to go to an undergraduate college like Barnard, and um, I felt very lucky, and I felt very fortunate, and I was reminded about that from my family, you know, from my grandparents. And um, I see education as as um, as a fundamental human right, mm. right? I, I'm driven by the motivation that every child has the right to that education. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we can talk sort of more pragmatically or, you know, look, looking at sort of economics of a country, when you are going to be investing into your human resources, when you're going to be investing into human development, you develop a country. You develop a country economically, right? There's the research that shows if you're going to be investing into girls' education and make sure that all women are literate and have access to education, you're going to be developing or contributing to, to economic development by a certain percentage. So um, to... to to answer your question simply, it's a question of social justice for me. Um, and, and, and while I might work with very large organizations and bureaucracies, I'm really driven by an activist side of me where um, I, I want to be able to improve access to education, to improve societies, and to, and to make societies more equal. Wow. wow. And you work with um, a lot of high-profile NGOs and, and IGOs as well. Yeah. And, for example, the United Nations High Commissioner for uh, Refugees. Yeah. Um, was it difficult uh, for you to accept um, and tell your family that, you know, you're going to go to these uh, post-conflict areas, as you, as you said? It was never difficult. My parents were 
have been amazing from the very beginning. You know, when I um, finished at Barnard, I had a the, the opportunity to have a short work experience in East Timor. And uh, my parents were only enthusiastic. My dad oh, yeah. was said, oh, go, I'm going to come and visit you. And this was in 2003, right? It was only two years after independence. Mm. But since about 2007, when I was traveling in East Africa, working in South Sudan, working in Palestine, working in Kyrgyzstan, my parents have never felt like they needed to hold me back. They've only ever been extremely supportive. And I think deep down, I, I imagine my mother has been a little nervous, right, about where I go. And I certainly limit the sort of scary stories that I tell her. <laughs> but, you know, everything turned out well. And um, I awesome. feel, as I said earlier, I feel very privileged. I feel that it's um, a... a a huge opportunity to bear witness and to bear testimony to how the majority of people live and how the majority of people face, you know, extreme challenges and, and extreme strife in their day to day. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned you worked in Timor and, yeah. and South Sudan. How did you choose the countries? Well, um, East Timor, you want to go to? yeah, East Timor was, you know, I, I, I finished high school in 99, and obviously those were quite um, turbulent years for, sure. for East Timor, and, and um, certainly uh, it was impactful to, to see it uh, separate and gain independence. And part of me was curious to understand, to understand what had happened there, what had led to its separation. Um, I, I guess it was just a, a very deep curiosity about what had occurred, basically, right. from the perspective of Timorese. And um, for South Sudan, South Sudan is a fascinating country because um, Sudan and South Sudan, but at the time it was one country, mm. were in a civil conflict for 40 years. And when I decided to go to South Sudan, there had been a comprehensive peace agreement that was known as the CPA at the time that had just been signed two years previously. Okay. So Sudan, and South Sudan was not an independent country yet, they only gained independence a couple of years later, was experiencing a relative period of peace for the first time in four decades. And it was at the time the largest humanitarian mission in the world mm -hmm. because there were... There was conflict in Darfur. There was relative peace, but a huge um, humanitarian vacuum that was being filled basically in South Sudan. Um, and there were operations that had basically been bringing aid and, and a lot of uh, uh, aid dollars into South Sudan from multiple points in the neighboring countries, from Kenya and from Uganda, because Sudan, when it was still one country, was the biggest country in, in, in Africa, I mean, with the Democratic Republic of Congo. And you can imagine, you know, approaching a country that size uh, is just a highly complex logistical right. mission. Uh, so for those reasons, one, uh, out of my, my curiosity about the country and also the fact that it was getting so much global attention at the time. Mm. Letitia, these countries undergone like significant uh, political changes yeah. and, and in a lot of cases like upheavals to mm -hmm. the citizens. Um, what do you think about the changes in the politics side? Do they have an effect on the education systems there during these changes? Or Yeah. Well, in South Sudan, I was seconded to the government. So I arrived in South Sudan at the end of 2007 in the capital of what became South Sudan, Juba. And at the time, there was nothing. I slept in a tent the first few months that I arrived. I lived in a prefabricated container, and I was seconded to the government. So that meant that UNICEF paid for my position, and I sat within the government of South Sudan. And the Ministry of Education was a container. What is a container? A container, like a shipping container. Oh there were no buildings. 
There were no buildings, or there were buildings, but they had been dilapidated be- during the war. So it was a very dusty town that I had arrived in, which was going to eventually become the capital of the country. And it caught a lot of the world's attention because there is a lot of oil between Sudan and South Sudan. So South Sudan has the potential to become a very wealthy country. But what we see in South Sudan now is when there are, there's poor governance and when money is not directed to the areas it needs to be directed in, such as education, uh, then you see a very unequal society. You know, children or rather I should say girl children, are more likely to get married than to finish secondary school. So early marriage, early pregnancy, sexual gender-based violence are unfortunately very harsh realities in countries like South Sudan. We're talking about one of the poorest countries in the world that has a potential to be a relatively wealthy country because of its natural resources. But when you combine that with poor governance, what you see is a, a an unequal, a poorly distributed uh, resource, right? Yeah. So education has a potential, as I've said earlier, to be this equalizer. And yet what we see is a country that's still mired in conflict, mm-hmm. right? We see now South Sudan being one of the longest conflicts since its independence, just mm-hmm since a couple of years ago. Mm. And South Sudanese refugees are now all over East Africa. There are South Sudanese refugees that are in Uganda and Kenya and Sudan, right? So uh, it's, it's really demonstrative of how governance is really key to bringing peace, to bringing stability, to bringing prosperity, and to ensuring that there's equality across the entire country and across all groups. Do you get to sit with the decision makers when you were um, advising them and in particularly maybe did you get to talk to the education minister? Yeah, well I sat cases? within I, I sat within the undersecretary's office. So okay. I didn't necessarily have access to the minister but I had access to the undersecretary. So the undersecretary was the equivalent of the COO, basically, and the minister is the CEO. And what was the interactions like? Did you get to like tell them, hey, I think this curriculum is, is good, or hey, I think that we should put more budget there? What was it like? Well, working with the government of South Sudan at the time, I was a, I was a technical advisor, so I sat within the ministry. But of course, I needed to remember the backgrounds of my colleagues, of my South Sudanese colleagues. You know, th- this is a country that had emerged from 40 years of civil war, basically, right? And a lot of the people that were in powers of authority within the ministry were also people who had come from directly from the army, right? Oh. So they had been sort of positioned within the army and then given jobs within the Ministry of Education. So, yes, I mean, in, a, in an extremely diplomatic thoughtful, compassionate way, yes, I advised on sort of education policy and planning. So to give you an example, I worked on the Education Act. So South Sudan was becoming, was preparing itself rather for its uh, independence, so for a referendum of independence. And so it was developing an Education Act, for example, you know, a, a schools act that would represent the new South Sudan. Or, for example, we were developing budgeting for the ministry. So how do you budget education for an entire country? That was a process that we call medium-term expenditure planning, right? So you sit with the different divisions of the ministry, the division for teacher training or the division for overage learners, accelerated education, which is the norm for a country that's been in conflict. And you say, okay, so what are your strategic objectives for the country, you know, and at the time it was a country of 10 million people for the next five years or for the next 10 years. And how do we plan for that? How do we budget for that? You know, what are going to be, what are, what will be the needs of teachers or what will the country's needs for teachers be in terms of how many teachers do you need to train? How many teachers do you need to supply? How do you get teachers to work in the most isolated parts of the country, right? This is a country that One had no paved roads. When I first moved to South Sudan, there were no paved roads. There were very few teachers that hadn't left during the war. There were no classrooms. 
you know, at the time, more than 50% of uh, lessons or classes occurred under trees or they occurred in tents. They didn't occur in buildings because buildings didn't exist. Schools didn't exist. You know, it was a country that had emerged from war and there was, there was no infrastructure. So uh, that was another directorate. That, there was a directorate for physical infrastructure. How do you rebuild a system, right? That, that has been s sadly and shockingly neglected for decades. So, but to answer your question, yes, I was able to sit with decision makers and I did that with, uh, with a, a lot of diplomacy, but also remembering where I was coming from and where they were coming from, right? You know, these are people who had fought for independence for their country and um, I needed to wear my humble hat and, and remember that, sure. you know, I couldn't be the outsider telling them, what, what I thought was best, you know, if anything, any major decision that had, that was going to be made for the education system was going to be coming from them. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was the support. I was, um, very much the advisor for the undersecretary, but very much more in a support technical role. Yeah. Were, were your experiences in other countries, uh, similar or, or different or yeah, you my, visited, uh, many, countries yeah well um so i always have been engaged in either um what what's called an emergency context or a refugee context so the emergency context is a shorter term humanitarian crisis for example and the refugee which context Sorry. emergency or emergency. humanitarian and then the refugee context can be a protracted context meaning you know, refugee context can last for up to 20 years. So refugees can be refugees for up to 20 years. The time frame is, is long. The time frame is different, exactly. Um, so in other countries, I didn't necessarily work within government. I worked with government, but I wasn't necessarily in a ministry, right? Um, so for example, when I was in Palestine, I was there after a, a conflict in Gaza called Operation Cast Lead, which was basically the bombing of Gaza over um, several weeks. And that was more of a coordination role. So I was coordinating the different education actors that were responding to the emergency in Gaza. Which year was this? That would have been 2009. So Operation Cast Lead was, the, was during December, January of 2008, nine, basically. Happened over several weeks and I got there a couple of months later as part of the humanitarian response. Um, and then in a country in Kyrgyzstan, for example, where there had been an ethnic conflict, I was essentially uh, providing short-term responses. So um, providing education interventions that, that would facilitate children's access back into the national system. But they were always working with government, um, with Ministry of Education and other ministries to facilitate children's access. Okay. And did you, mm -hmm. it, the language, I hope I don't, I don't sound too technical <laughs> and that I'm speaking in a, in a clear way. Yeah. Uh, I think so far so good. And then good. We, we can research it more if, if, <laughs> if like, you know, if there are terms or, or people that we want to, uh, definitely dive deeper. If we can like picture you, uh, in, in the field, will you be in the classroom or would you be in office? No, what, I, what, so, what's a typical day? so, so uh, we always work with ministries, right? The, the position that we take, be it UNICEF or say the children or UNHCR is that we support government, right? So I'm not teaching ever. I'm working with my counterparts in the government on how to plan or rebuild or budget accordingly. Mm. Yeah. I'm not trained as a teacher. My background is really in the sort of policy and planning side of it. And I have always focused on post-conflict contexts or refugee contexts. And how, how many languages do you speak? Oh, uh, you I know, mean, I speak a sort of splattering of French and Indonesian and a little bit of Spanish and Italian, but oh, wow. splatterings of a little bit here and oh, there. Wow, five languages. Amazing. What were some of the most insightful um, and like heartfelt moments in, in your 
like experiences? I'm sure you have a lot. Oh, gosh. Um, you mean just in terms of my professional life? Uh, yeah. In, in the um, field. You know, I... I I didn't really know where to start in that. It it has been such a privilege for me to travel to where I've traveled to and the countries that I've been to. You know, the, I would have never gone to a country like South Sudan or Sudan or Nigeria or Chad or Liberia or Kyrgyzstan. Like, I would have never been able to access these countries, you know, or or, or even have thought of going to them. And... Um, I guess my interactions with colleagues in all these countries has been incredible. The way that people just welcome you, they open you into their into their lives, into their homes, and you meet families yeah. and you you understand their cultures and their societies. If anything, it's always been the interactions with the people I work with from those countries. Mm. Um, I also have. A lot of great experiences um, working directly with schools, so meeting teachers or heads of schools, and when I'm finally able to interact with kids, with students, it's it's a real pleasure, right? I mean, um, yeah. I love my job. I mm. love the fact that I. Uh, it's a very human job in the sense that I interact with people quite a lot you know when I'm in the field when when I'm working remotely obviously I'm just in front of my computer and I'm just responding to emails or working on a document oh, yeah. but when I'm in the field it's uh it's wonderful you know it's this uh you're just sort of reminded of humanity and and of the the basic foundations and lessons of human compassion and kindness right so yeah the the long answer to your question is uh the people that humanity really awesome yeah this your parents were super well educated um your dad is was a, a graduate of INSEAD and your mom um where did your mom mom study? mom studied uh, microbiology at the university of wisconsin at madison oh, wow. and then she also studied french literature french civilization at the sorbonne yeah is that like a, a master is it a different um degree, i or? think it was a i think it was a, a certificate in french french language and civilization oh. yeah and did that legacy sort of like shaped you to be, shape you to become who you are um yeah well listen from day one education was the most important in our house right we paul and i we did fairly well at school. Um, Who's Paul? Oh, Who's... that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul is my lovely brother, <laughs> Paul Lemaitre, um, who I shout hope you'll have. As, <laughs> shout out to Paul. I hope you'll have him as a future guest <laughs> in the show. Sure. Uh, so we, I think we both enjoyed education. I think we mm. were both encouraged to do what we felt really passionate about. Um, I think amongst all the cousins, our, amongst all our, our first and second cousins, uh, a lot of us ended up studying history or international relations or economics, business. Um, but I think for, with mom and pop, it was just, you know, study what you love, right? I, I remember um, at one point I was flirting with the idea of being a major in South Asian civilizations and cultures. And for that, I would have... Which, have, which civilization? South Asian. South Asian. Yeah, because I'd been a study abroad student in mm. India. And for that, I would have needed to study either Hindi or Arabic. And I remember speaking to my dad and I said, I'm a little bit torn. I'm thinking about studying this as my major for for undergrad mm. should i be a uh, should i study hindi or should i study arabic and pop just said what's going to make you happier wow. what will make you happiest what will give you the most happiest. joy <laughs> right and um it's not even a comparison it's the, the absolute i love that yeah, yeah it was just what what will give you the most joy well you know what, what do you think will and I said, no, but what's going to be the most practical? Like, what will, what will, 
what will make me uh, more eligible or more prepared for a job? You know, I was really thinking like that as a as a like a young as kid, anyone. like a twenty year old, right? Yeah. And and Pop said, doesn't matter. You know, just study what you want to study, and everything will work out all right as long as you love what you're studying, as long as you love what you do, and that's really stuck with me. You know, that yeah. was a conversation I had in my. 20s like maybe I was 21 or so and the fact that my dad just said whatever you are passionate about what you whatever you love doing is the most important thing yeah right and and um those are really wise words it doesn't really matter how big your salary is if you hate your job if you are yep. miserable in what you're doing day to day, right? <laughs> um, that should not be the motivator in terms of like what's going to be, what's going to make you the most successful is what you love doing, right? And and your success is determined by your level of happiness, how you give back to others, how you feel fulfilled in your own professional and personal development. That should ultimately be the driver in your education and the choices that you make as a young person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's an an advice that is uh, very uh, very core, very very fundamental. Absolutely. Right? And education and happiness does seem to to correlate and because if it's if it resonates with your heart and with humanity, it's it's, it's perpetual like the learning and relationships and so on. Absolutely. Yeah. And I and I don't just mean academia, right? I don't mean you have to have a degree in, ter in, in your sort of formal learning or education, right? Um, I don't think everyone necessarily wants to be at university, but I think all young people deserve a skill set. They deserve to be able to pursue their passion. If that's in technical or vocational training or some kind of entrepreneurship program, so be it, right? But how do you prepare people to be able to pursue their their passions, their interests, their ambitions for themselves. And I would hope that whatever those passions are, they contribute to the societies around them, that people are able to give back, that they're able to make this world a better place in whatever way they choose to do so. Is that by building a business? Is that by being a teacher? Is that by being a scientist or an inventor, you know, I think fundamentally those edu our education systems need to be looking at how we're promoting entrepreneurship, how we're promoting innovation. And if you choose to be an academic, so be it. It's like good for you. And, you know, but it's, it's really cultivating that, that sense of, um, of, of being able to um, guide your way through it, right? And, and, and making sure that people feel confident in building their own mm. lives. Yeah. You know, what are the skill sets that they can build their lives with? Yeah, yeah. And it's funny that informal education has been on the rise, like, recently, or maybe um, for longer than, than I thought, like, non-outside-of-school education. Because then, you know, I don't know, in ancient times, the learning doesn't just happen in, in the classroom, right? It can happen in like, in the societies, in in in, in, in the gossip section, or in in the ports, in, the, in 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 the field. You know how you become a better farmer, or how you become a better warrior. Yeah. Um, what do you think the role of, of of informal education, like these online courses and these off school, off system education? I think there's a lot of emphasis today on formal education in terms of having your the formal training and the diploma and, you know, being prepared for uh, the career track. I don't think there's enough emphasis on that informal preparation. Um, you know, I think if you can get a certificate or to show that you've, you've, uh, you've completed your informal training, good, good for you. But it's to go back to what I was saying earlier, um, you know, Curriculum is everything. Curriculum doesn't exist in just a national system. Curriculum is the life skills that we, we gain from all interactions in our lives, right? Curriculum is just a, 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 an approach to learning. And learning can be informal. You know, learning can be developing a long list of podcasts to be, to, to be listening to and like teaching yourself along the way. 
or it could be an online course, for example, or it could be a series of webinars that you're signing up for or a, a series of talks that you join at your nearest co-working space, whatever. But it's, it's um, again, linked to preparing people with a skill set that confidently sends them out in the world, mm -hmm. right? And that's not only formal education. That can also be very much informal training. But it's, I think that, that what's missing is that bridge to preparing the individual to be guiding their way in their, to be the, to be the owner or to be the, the navigator of their education. Right, yeah. How do you teach people to learn mm. themselves, mm. right? That's yeah. the skill set that people need. Mm. And if they have that, then they can go anywhere with mm. that. Yeah. It does take you um, longer to develop that or it will be better to know earlier when it, in advance that the objective is to learn, not just like memorize, not rote memorization, but it's a, it's a skill. Right. Yeah, learning is a, is a skill. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's funny that one of the most significant informal educations I've had is, is actually in my church in Jakarta where they teach about personal development and character and they take stuff from online, from psychologists, from, from businessmen, from whoever. But it does provide it, me and people from the class like an... A, a substitute mm -hmm. a yeah a, um, a substitute to, if you you may not have had that education in, in school but there's just these institutions that are are hungry and want to want to share and that's what's awesome about people these days I think <laughs> yeah uh, learning and education doesn't come solely from a school right from the formal institution or from a ministry of education that comes from all aspects of our life. Yeah. yeah. But, but Tish, how, what can we do on the existing formal education system? Say, for example, Indo, like, um, I don't know, and I don't know if the viewers know about the current educational uh, quality like in, in, in Indonesia, but what can be done to this country? I, I should... I should just add as a caveat now that I haven't been working within the formal education system in Indonesia for quite a long time, for I sort see. of 12 years. But I can sort of speak more broadly um, about educa education systems in general, if that's all right. Sure. Um, you know, I, th I think, as what you said earlier, there tends to be a very strong focus on rote learning, on memorization, and um, a lot of emphasis on the earlier years of primary education, right? So there might be a focus on sort of grades one to grade six, with less of a focus on the transition to secondary education and less of a, trans less of a focus on um, the transition to tertiary education, right? So oftentimes ministries of education you know, over the last few decades have focused on the first six years, you know, making sure that there's access to basic education and that people leave with literacy, that they leave with basic numeracy, right, that they can pass their national exams. But it's not so much focusing on the individual learner and the individual learner's needs, right? So it's, again, going back to that skill set, like how are you preparing young people to be achieving their potential once they leave school, mm. right? So I think all, all people, all y children have the right to formal education. But then how are we preparing them in a way, you know, what's the quality of education to make sure that they flourish, that they thrive, not only in the system, but once they leave the system. Mm. And if you look at education systems globally, there's uh, oftentimes uh, less focus on the secondary aspect, right? And then secondary education, so on SMA, on term in terms of like, a higher quality of education that's delivered there, and then people being prepared to transition to employment. So how do you prepare them, either one for university, or how you prepare them for technical vocational programs afterwards, right? And, um, you know, 
what they're learning in SD or SMB or SMA, is that going to best prepare them for their lives after school? Mm. Is that going to best prepare them for entering the job market? Are those the skills that are going to be encouraging innovation? Are those the skills that are going to be encouraging young entrepreneurs? Mm. Uh, are we creating, and I'm speaking again more broadly in systems of education, you know, all over the world, are we encouraging um, critical thinking? Are mm. we encouraging people to challenge the status quo? If we see a problem that's existed for a very long time, are we encouraging or cultivating young people to look at that problem with fresh eyes and try to solve it a different way? Mm. So, uh, y you know, I, I, I believe that, n you know, national curriculum needs to be in place as an equalizer. So all people have the right to the same level of education. But is that education producing the kinds of people that we want mm. to be solving some of the countries and some of the world's biggest problems? Mm. You know, how are we training and preparing people for, uh, for to challenge big problems? Mm. Who gets to make the curriculum? This, um, and, and the, it doesn't have to be you know, like any country. Who, who, is it the lawmakers? Is it... Minister? Yeah, well, so so uh, oftentimes, uh, and and I I don't know what the the body would be called in Indonesia necessarily, but the a Ministry of Education will have a team of curriculum specialists, and you decide as the body of curriculum specialists. So that might be a directorate or a division within a Ministry of Education. They decide, okay, kids will learn. Kids should know this by a certain age, right? So by este dua, they should know. X, Y, Z. So mm -hmm. how do we prepare them? Like, what are the lessons that they need to have to, the, to achieve that benchmark? It's a KPI kind of thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, th and that is measured by formal exams here, right? So mm -hmm. are kids learning what the national curriculum states they should know by now? Mm -hmm. Right. KPI. <laughs> You think that's a good measure, or do I think national exams are yeah. a good measure? No, because they don't necessarily meet the needs of individual learners. You know, all human beings are unique. Do we do we need to know certain skill sets? Yes. Do we all need to know the exactly same type of information in history geography? To a certain degree, are exams the best way to measure it? Probably not. Actually, you know they. I think exams measure how well people take exams. They don't necessarily measure yeah. the knowledge that a person has, yeah. right? And certain people freak out in exams. Some people really don't perform well under pressure, right? Yeah. Um, some people are able to memorize huge amounts of information mm. that the national exam tests for. Mm. That doesn't necessarily mean, if, the, if someone doesn't perform well in a national exam, it doesn't mean they don't know anything. It just means that you have to measure their intelligence in a different way or measure their knowledge or their attainment of a curriculum in a different way. Yeah. So, no, I don't think national exams are necessarily the best way of doing it, you know. And it's, a, it's an enormous challenge because when you're talking about millions and millions and millions of kids in the national education system and you want to be able to understand how well they've done, what's the best way to measure that? Do you measure that as an individual student? But the reality is the teacher has... 40 kids in the classroom. So an exam is an easy way of doing it. Is it the best way? Probably not. It's yeah. not the fair way of doing it, in my opinion. Yeah. Wow, yeah. Tish, now you're pursuing a doctorate in education. Um, what, what is that like? What do, you, what do you do and what is the goal? I am looking at the transition of refugee children into the national education system. And I'm looking at Turkey and Greece. So you might know that Turkey at the moment is the largest refugee hosting country in the world. It has 4 million refugees, 3.5 million Syrian refugees. And they're trying to include refugee children into the national system of education of Turkey which is an enormous challenge. One, because many of these refugee children don't speak Turkish. They have been out of school for many years 
And oftentimes they've experienced really traumatizing events because they've come from a conflict context like Syria. So my ultimate objective in doing the doctorate is very personal. I am passionate about this field and I want to, I want to be a better researcher and I want to feel that I'm contributing to a body of knowledge. I also want to, uh, and this is less important, I would hope that my research is able to influence or, or demonstrate some of the best practices in including refugee kids in national education mm -hmm. systems. You know, globally there are um, probably about 28 million now, I just looked at the figures from UNHCR recently, 28 million refugees globally, and 50% of those are kids. They're under the age of 18. And refugee children are more likely to be out of school. Mm -hmm. So we know that one in two refugee children access primary education. We know that one in four refugee youth access secondary education and that only 1% of refugees globally access tertiary education. They access university. So the numbers are uh, very challenging. They're abysmal for refugee learners. Um, but we're talking about huge numbers of people, and those numbers are likely to increase over the next few decades. They are, we can expect more and more people to be displaced, so sent out of their countries and to become refugees. I love that you say it. It's it's, it's challenging because it hints at a probability. It's not absolute. It's not impossible. It's oh. our challenge, you know, to like go for that. Yeah, I like how you approach that. I like your thinking around that, Nick, because it's not impossible. It it means that, um, and it goes back to what I'm saying about education policies, right? It means that policies have to be more inclusive mm. to refugee learners. And not only do they have to be more inclusive, they have to be um, planned better. Mm -hmm. So that means if you're gonna have a million refugee kids enter your national education system, mm -hmm. you know, in the context of mm -hmm. Turkey, for example, do you have the teachers who are trained to accommodate refugee learners? Do you have teachers who are trained to accommodate kids who have Turkish as a second language, for example? Do you have teachers who are trained to work with kids who have psychosocial needs because they've experienced traumatizing events and that they're a little bit older than cl kids in their classrooms, right? Because yeah. maybe they've missed three, four, five, six years of their education. Mm. So you need to sort of develop special programs for them. But with that means that you need a lot of budget, right? You need more classrooms, you need more toilets, you need more drinking water in schools, you need more play areas. Um, it's not just, uh, the, it, it, there's the human aspect in terms of training people to be prepared and to be more compassionate, you know, the intercultural preparation, but it's also the physical preparation, right? How do you, how do you build a system that's ready to be more robust if there's an influx of refugee learners? Yeah. How did they travel from Syria to They crossed the border. They, I mean, I imagine it's, it's not easy, but it's not easy at all, but is it, do they, do they like cross like wars? Do they, did they, did they, yeah. did they risk their lives and did it, do they pass like mountains where they're, is, is it, it's not an easy feat, right? It's, it's a great question because I think a lot of people have a hard time visualizing what that looks like, right? So I've been working on um, the Syria crisis basically since the outbreak of the war. And I've been in countries where there are large numbers of Syrian refugees. So I've been in Lebanon where there's a million Syrian refugees. I've been in Turkey where there's three and a half million Syrian refugees. I've been in Egypt where there's about 150,000 Syrian refugees. Um, and in many cases, it's what you've described. People who have feared for their lives, they've feared persecution, they are living in towns that have been destroyed by the war, or they may be in the uh, middle of fighting between two factions, and they have literally needed to uproot themselves and seek safety. So they seek what's called 
international asylum protection, right, from the international community. And that means they literally, many of them, walk across a border. And because once they've crossed the border, they have sought what is called international protection. So they should be given asylum protection in that country. What does an asylum mean? What, what, what are they... Sure. Yeah. To- so when so when a refugee, when a person who is caught up in a in a conflict or a crisis zone crosses a national border, so for example, when they leave Syria and they go to Turkey, they are seeking what is called asylum or international protection from the international community. That means they uh, they must not be sent back to their home country, and that they must be given the rights and protected within their host country. So they have the right to access shelter or they have the right to access education or health. And that's part of our commitment to protecting refugees globally. And every country abides to this Those, commitment? Th- that's, a, that's also a very good question. Those are countries that have signed to the Refugee Convention of 1951. And not all countries have, not all countries have, but the majority of the world's countries have. That means that they are committed by international refugee convention to protect people mm. who are seeking asylum. So in countries such as Turkey, they can be a citizen? They can They're not to... citizens. No, 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 not no. Citizens. so they're okay. under what is called um, temporary protection. So mm. they have what's given as refugee status. Mm. Turkey recognizes them as refugees, and mm-hmm. therefore when you are recognized, you are given the rights and you are given the protection so uh, Syrian children, refugees recognized in Turkey, have the right to access education. You know, mm-hmm. if they are sick, they have the right to access medical care or health care, mm-hmm. for example. They may not have the right to work. So the right to work is a little bit different in mm-hmm. each country. But oftentimes the right to education is, uh, is fundamental, is, is part of what should be provided. Yeah, yeah I'm starting to imagine what these kids go, th- go through, uh, like, where do they go on a daily basis? What can you know they do? Can they play soccer with one another? I don't know. Can they like hang out and can they tackle the exams together? I don't know. Um, do they get an identity card? Yeah. So oftentimes they're given some kind of identity card. So they uh, oftentimes have to be recognized as refugees to be given the status. So they might have to go through an interview that says, okay, how do you prove that you're a refugee? How can you prove that if you go back, you will be killed or your life is in danger, for example? And then once they receive the refugee status, they uh, will either be in what's, what might be a refugee camp or they might go to an urban context. So most refugees in the world are actually in cities. You know, I think people have this image of refugee camps. And it's true that a lot of refugees live in camps, which are sort of tented cities or prefabricated container cities. But actually the majority of refugees live in big cities like Istanbul, for example, or Beirut, or Cairo, um, and they sort of navigate their lives as people do in big cities. Yeah, and I imagine they want to go for a new lifestyle, right? That's why they in the urban well areas, right? Or no? You know, I think there's a lot of misunderstandings about refugees that they are just trying to improve their their lives and their, you know, their, their, what are they actually escaping? They didn't need to escape what they were, you know, oftentimes refugees are leaving horrible situations or conflict situations where their lives and their family lives are really at risk. They're threatened, they're persecuted, for example, right? And so being in a host country means that you have the, one, you, you're, you have safety, you're protected first and foremost, but you have the ability to rebuild your lives. And oftentimes, education is key. It's what refugees ask for. You know, they want, they want their children to be given a better situation than they currently have, right? So making sure that refugee children are able to access education upon arrival in a host country is critical. You know, making sure that refugee children are included in the system, but also in the host society is critical. Mm. Especially when you're talking, in the case of Turkey, for example, about three and a half million Syrian refugees. So so many. 
sometimes I remember my model United Nations days. Like you make laws, like like fake laws with other countries, and feel like making those again. Were you ever involved in those debate mm. clubs? In MUN, I was not no. in MUN, unfortunately. I think I would have really liked it, actually. <laughs> yeah, maybe you would. You would have killed that field. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Wow, the situation there quite. It's a quite it's a lot to take in, you know. I think there's a sort of mixed understanding of. Of, of how a lot of people in this world live, right? A lot of people in this world live in very unsafe contexts. Mm. And that's something that we can easily take for granted or we don't understand because we don't see it in the news as much. It's not as reported, right? Yeah. You've got Trump on the news or you've got whatever election that's going on, you know, like, I, I feel like if I open the news now, it's all about the Democratic primaries and you forget to cover the other stories yeah. that's that are happening. Yeah. Yeah, they don't realize that if you think together, maybe you'll come up with better solutions. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of it has to do with collaborating between very different actors. It's about collaborating within different education stakeholders. It's about collaborating with the private sector. It's mm. about collaborating uh, with different people with different ways of thinking, right? And how you approach problems from a different angle. And collaboration means that you have people who are very good at problem solving with different types of skill sets, with different types of approaches and strategies come together to solve a really big problem. Yes. And so when we talk about refugee education, we're not just talking about ministries of education. We're talking about some of the world's pioneer in online learning, for example, yeah. creating virtual classrooms. We're yeah. talking about huge foundations like uh, IKEA, who are building uh, classrooms out of prefabricated containers to solve the, the challenges with about space, for example, oh, cool. and like creating new types of shelter for refugees, so you don't have shelter uh, shelters that don't provide a, a life of dignity for refugees right and instead of giving a, yeah. a tent how do you give like a home but it's like a collapsible uh, and an easily built home yeah. from prefabricated containers so yeah. you have real problem solvers who are able to bring a, a plethora of new ways of thinking yeah. yeah yeah when you like democratize the the process like this is a better possible chance of, of success like Um, I read this book by Ray Dalio. He he was a financier, but he emphasizes this idea called idea meritocracy, where mm-hmm. the best idea wins. Mm-hmm. So it's not seniority, although seniority plays some factor, but it's the weight of your opinions and, yeah. and how they come about. And when you say private sectors can come and IKEA can provide like real estate, that that would be so cool to like um, solve this problem together the best ideas win when we recognize that it's not one country's problem Mm -hmm. that we understand that it's um, an international obligation and that Mm -hmm. we as the international community have to be committed together collaborating together to find a solution right Mm -hmm. and that's when the best idea wins when it's not just seen as one person's problem Mm -hmm. but it's seen as a global effort right Mm. And that's when you get some of the best thinkers to come together to approach, for example, yeah. refugee education in a concerted way. Yeah. Yeah, because we share this world, this magnificent ball of earth. And, you know, sometimes I imagine if there are no borders, no citizens, like, would we help one another? Do we? How do we do that? And this system is both an opportunity and a downside, but it is what it is, and it is a web of people, a network of people, and how do you debate these these things? I, I couldn't agree with you more. Borders are arbitrary in many ways. You know, there is a lot more that unites us and connects us than divides us, really. Yes. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter what you decide to worship, who you decide to worship, how you worship them, how you choose to live your... Uh, how, do you, how you choose to spend your time. I mean, I... I we're more similar than we are different, you know, and I, 
And um, I feel very lucky that the last 14, 15 years, has, that's rung very true for me. Um, you know, I, I, I like to say that uh, my parents really prepared Paul and I to go forth in this world in many ways, right? They, they gave us this confidence that wherever we go in this world, whatever we choose to do, we would be safe. We would make friends. We would have networks. We would make connections. You know, wow. I think they, they really prepared us, especially um, the way that my father traveled in his younger days, the way that my mom was very committed to travel and to learning that, um, you know, this, it's, a, it's a big, beautiful place to discover. And, uh, and, and, if we, and if we choose not to discover it, it's our loss, really, right? And um, uh, I, I, I think there's. A, I feel very lucky, as I've as I've told you many times in this conversation, to have had the opportunity to see very different parts of this world and places that I would have never accessed before. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you you did went to like beautiful places and beautiful people. Right, you know. Yeah, and um, you know, sometimes I sometimes I'm in an airport and um, I'll see someone from South Sudan, and you can South Sudan has some of the tallest people in the world. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Is it average? Height? Oh, just uh, you you wouldn't believe. I mean, you know, s- six the, five, six seven five? feet. You know, they're just really? such tall people. Like the Dutch, the Dutch also tall. Like, yes. Like, yeah, okay, absolutely. Well, and yeah. I'll see someone and I'll be like, I bet he's South Sudanese or I bet she's South Sudanese. And I'll usually just go up and I say, by any chance, are you from South Sudan? And uh, oftentimes I'm right. And <laughs> I'll just start a conversation with them. And I'll be like, you know, I lived in your country from 2007 to 2009. And um, it's such a nice, I think, I hope they anyway appreciate me reaching out to them. I think they generally like it when, you know, sort of strangers just start a friendly conversation <laughs> yeah. in an airport. I've never been, um, I've never been ignored by anyone before, you know, and I just think that's part of our common humanity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are awesome conversations. Yeah. Hope, I'm hoping they, they happen more often than, you know, like there's random talks in an <laughs> airport or whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. It is um one of the reasons why I started motiva- motivational podcast is to talk about like growth stories. If people want to be a humanity humanitarian uh, worker just like you, and what would you uh, suggest to to them? What would you advise them? One, identify the sector that you want to specialize in. So you know, to be a humanitarian worker means you need to come with a specialization. You need to be a water specialist or you need to be a shelter specialist or you need to be a protection specialist or an education specialist. And you need to have, you need to be good in that field, very good, right? So you need to be able to, uh, in a humanitarian crisis, for example, if you're a water specialist, you're providing drinking water, clean latrines or hand washing facilities and you are, uh, you're, you, you're in a technical field, for what example. Latrines? What? latrines, toilets, for example. So in humanitarian emergencies, if you're talking about millions of people who are in displacement. So one, have your sector. Have sector. your field, field, right? Your specialization. Yeah. And spend as much time as you can in the field. You know, don't start your internship or your career in a headquarters job. You have to go to the field and you have to spend as much time working in really difficult locations, um, you need to put yourself out there fully. Oh, yeah. And has there been time it was outside of your comfort zone? Yes, every single time. (laughs) Really? Yes. Uh I have always been a little nervous, a little anxious, a little bit scared about where I was going next. I didn't, I didn't, know very much about Kyrgyzstan when I first arrived. I didn't know, I couldn't anticipate what my life was going to be like in South Sudan. I didn't know what it was going to be like to enter Gaza after a war. I was always nervous. I was always scared. But I, I, you know, I, sometimes I didn't have a choice. I had signed up for something and I said, okay, I've got to do this, you know. 
and it was fine. You know, I worked, it worked out okay. It worked out fine. And, um, and I learned a lot and I loved, I loved the experiences. Yeah. What's next for you? Well, yeah, you have some plans out there or? I'm going to spend the next year with my doctorate. So I want to be doing my data collection and my writing. So I'll be hopefully in Istanbul next year and I'll be looking at refugee youth in Istanbul. And then from there, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm happy to be back home for a little while. I'm happy to be here. Um, and I'm lucky that my job with UNHCR now allows me to be working remotely. So I travel a little bit for the job. You know, I've got some trips lined up to Zambia, Uganda, Ethiopia the next few months. But uh, my plan is to be here and make sure my roots are here for a little while. Is Uganda, are, are those part of your doctorate? or? Those are just for my job. So I've got my full-time job with UNHCR. So I'm going to Uganda, Ethiopia for the Sassanese refugee response and then to Zambia for the Congolese refugee response. And then um, I'll go to Turkey in 2020 for the Syria response, but that's for my doctorate research. How do you find time with the doctor? Can you like take leave? I don't or? have time. <laughs> that's why I told you I wanted one hour of doing nothing and just sitting <laughs> still basically. Yeah. Um, I sometimes negotiate leave um, with UNHCR. So I take sometimes a couple of weeks off every, you know, few months to like take classes or do some writing, do my own research. But that's why in 2020, I'm just going to be doing my own research and, and um, taking a little break from the professional life and just focus on my studies. Oh, yeah. And when do you expect to finish the doctorate? Oh, you never ask, you never yeah. ask a doctoral student <laughs> when they finish, by the way, because they may never finish. The, the longer, the better. <laughs> <laughs> but the longer, the better. It is. It's like wine. <laughs> Hopefully not too long because I'm paying for it myself. So um, we would like it to be over by 2021. So two more years. It all goes well. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. Hey, this is um, it's been an amazing podcast. I learned so much from you, and I'm sure that everyone can understand and be inspired by your learnings and your desire. I uh -huh. um, I hope I didn't speak in a too technical language. Sometimes I sort of get caught up in my education speak and my refugee speak. So if you ever want to sit down and talk a little bit more about all these issues, I would love that. I always um, love engaging with people on these topics. They're topics that are really near and dear to me that I feel very passionate about. And um, if I can encourage people to think about refugees or education in a different way, um, it, it just it makes me very happy. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, that's it guys um, as you just heard uh, we all live in this one planet and we're together and it's a concerted effort it's us it's not us and them it's just us amen uh, uh, yeah. love it uh, thanks. thanks thank Ace. you thank you that's guys mm -hmm.